Part Eight. Well then, he said. My conviction is that the earth is a round body in the centre of the heavens, and therefore has no need of air or any similar force to be a support, but is kept there, and hindered from falling or inclining any way, by the equability of the surrounding heaven, and by her own equipoise, for that which, being in equipoise, is in the centre of that which is equally diffused, will not incline any way in any degree but will always remain in the same state, and not deviate. And this is my first notion. Which is surely a correct one, said Simeus. Also, I believe that the earth is very vast, and that we who dwell in the region extending from the river Phasis to the pillars of Heracles inhabit a small portion only about the sea, like ants or frogs about a marsh, and that there are other inhabitants of many other like places. For everywhere on the face of the earth there are hollows of various forms and sizes, into which the water and the mist and the lower air collect. But the true earth is pure, and situated in the pure heaven. There are stars also, and it is the heaven which is commonly spoken of by us as the ether, and of which our own earth is the sediment gathering in the hollows beneath. But we who live in these hollows are deceived into the notion that we are dwelling above on the surface of the earth, which is just as if a creature, who was at the bottom of the sea, were to fancy that he was on the surface of the water, and that the sea was the heaven through which he saw the sun and the other stars. He, having never come to the surface by reason of his feebleness and sluggishness, and having never lifted up his head and seen, nor ever heard from one who had seen, how much purer and fairer the world above is than his own. And such is exactly our case, for we are dwelling in a hollow of the earth, and fancy that we are on the surface, and the air we call the heaven, in which we imagine that the stars move. But the fact is, that owing to our feebleness and sluggishness, we are prevented from reaching the surface of the air. For if any man could arrive at the exterior limit, or take the wings of a bird and come to the top, then, like a fish, who puts his head out of the water and sees this world, he would see a world beyond. And if the nature of man could sustain the sight, he would acknowledge that this other world was the place of the true heaven and the true light and the true earth, for our earth, and the stories, and the stones, and the entire region which surrounds us, are spoilt and corroded, as in the sea all things are corroded by the brine, neither is there any noble or perfect growth, but caverns only, and sand, and an endless slough of mud, and even the shore is not to be compared to the fairer sights of this world and still less is this our world to be compared with the other. Of that upper earth which is under the heaven, I can tell you a charming tale, Simeus, which is well worth hearing. And we, Socrates, replied Simeus, shall be charmed to listen to you. The tale, my friend, he said, is as follows. In the first place, the earth, when looked at from above, is in appearance streaked, like one of those balls which have leather coverings in twelve pieces, and is decked with various colours, of which the colours used by painters on earth are in a manner samples. But there the whole earth is made up of them, and they are brighter far and clearer than ours. There is a purple of wonderful lustre, also the radiance of gold, and the white which is in the earth is wider than any chalk or snow. Of these and other colours the earth is made up. They are more in number and fairer than the eye of man has ever seen. The very hollows, of which I was speaking, filled with air and water, have a colour of their own, and are seen like light gleaming amid the diversity of the other colours so that the whole represents a single and continuous appearance of variety in unity, and in this fair region everything that grows, trees and flowers and fruits, are in a like degree fairer than any here, and there are hills 
having stones in them in a like degree smoother and more transparent and fairer in colour than our highly valued emeralds and sardonyxes and jaspers and other gems but which are but minute fragments of them for there all the stones are like our precious stones and fairer still the reason is that they are pure and not like our precious stones infected or corroded by the corrupt briny elements which coagulate among us and which breed foulness and disease both in earth and stones as well as in animals and plants they are the jewels of the upper earth which also shines with gold and silver and the like and they are set in the light of day and are large and abundant and in all places making the earth a sight to gladden the beholder's eye and there are animals and men some in a middle region others dwelling about the air as we dwell about the sea others in islands which the air flows round near the continent and in a word the air is used by them as the water and sea are by us and the ether is to them what the air is to us moreover the temperament of their seasons is such that they have no disease and live much longer than we do and have sight and hearing and smell and all the other senses in far greater perfection in the same proportion that air is purer than water or the ether than air also they have temples and sacred places in which the gods really dwell and they hear their voices and receive their answers and are conscious of them and hold converse with them and they see the sun moon and stars as they truly are and their other blessedness is of a piece with this such is the nature of the whole earth and of the things which are around the earth and there are diverse regions in the hollows on the face of the globe everywhere some of them deeper and more extended than that which we inhabit others deeper but with a narrower opening than ours and some are shallower and also wider all have numerous perforations and there are passages broad and narrow in the interior of the earth connecting them with one another and there flows out of and into them as into basins a vast tide of water and huge subterranean streams of perennial rivers and springs hot and cold and a great fire and great rivers of fire and streams of liquid mud thin or thick like the rivers of mud in sicily and the lava dreams which follow them and the regions about which they happen to flow are filled up with them and there is a swinging or seesaw in the interior of the earth which moves all this up and down and is due to the following cause there is a chasm which is the vastest of them all and pierces right through the whole earth this is that chasm which homer describes in the words far off where is the inmost depth beneath the earth and which he in other places and many other poets have called tartarus and the seesaw is caused by the streams flowing into and out of this chasm and they each have the nature of the soil through which they flow and the reason why the streams are always flowing in and out is that the watery element has no bed or bottom but is swinging and surging up and down and the surrounding wind and air do the same they follow the water up and down hither and thither over the earth just as in the act of respiration the air is always in process of inhalation and exhalation and the wind swinging with the water in and out produces fearful and irresistible blasts when the waters retire with a rush into the lower parts of the earth as they are called they flow through the earth in those regions, and fill them up like water raised by a pump. And then, when they leave those regions, and rush back hither, they again fill the hollows here, and when these are filled, flow through subterranean channels, and find their way to their several places, forming seas and lakes and rivers and springs. Thence they again enter the earth, some of them making a long circuit into many lands, others going to a few places, and not so distant, 
and again fall into Tartarus, some at a point a good deal lower than that at which they rose, and others not much lower, but all in some degree lower than the point from which they came, and some burst forth again on the opposite side, and some on the same side, and some wind round the earth with one or many folds like the coils of a serpent, and descend as far as they can but always return and fall into the chasm. The rivers flowing in either direction can descend only to the centre and no further, for opposite to the rivers is a precipice. Now these rivers are many, and mighty, and diverse, and there are four principal ones, of which the greatest and outermost is called the Oceanus, which flows around the earth in a circle, and in the opposite direction flows Acheron, which passes under the earth through the desert places into the Acherusian lake. This is the lake to the shores of which the souls of the many go when they are dead, and after waiting an appointed time, which is to some a longer and to some a shorter time, they are sent back to be born again as animals. The third river passes out between the two, and near the place of outlet pours into a vast region of fire and forms a lake larger than the Mediterranean Sea, boiling with water and mud. Proceeding muddy and turbid, and winding about the earth, comes, among other places, to the extremities of the Acherusian lake, but mingles not with the waters of the lake, and after making many coils about the earth, plunges into the Tartarus at a deeper level. This is that Pyriphlegethon, as the stream is called, which throws up jets of fire in different parts of the earth. The fourth river goes out on the opposite side, and falls first of all into a wild and savage region, which is all of a dark blue colour, like lapis lazuli, and this is that river which is called the Stygian river, and falls into and forms the lake Styx, and after falling into the lake and receiving strange powers in the waters, passes under the earth, winding round in the opposite direction, and comes near the Acherusian lake from the opposite side to the Pyriphlegethon. And the water of this river, too, mingles with no other, but flows round in a circle, and falls into Tartarus over against Pyriphlegethon. And the name of the river, as the poets say, is Coxitis. Such is the nature of the other world. And when the dead arrive at the place to which the genius of each severally guides them, first of all they have sentence passed upon them, as they have lived well and piously, or not. And those who appear to have lived neither well nor ill go to the river Acheron, and embarking in any vessels which they may find, are carried in them to the lake, and there they dwell and are purified of their evil deeds and having suffered the penalty of the wrongs which they have done to others, they are absolved, and receive the rewards of their good deeds, each of them according to his deserts. But those who appear to be incurable by reason of the greatness of their crimes, who have committed many and terrible deeds of sacrilege, murders foul and violent, or the like, such are hurled into Tartarus, which is their suitable destiny and they never come out. Those, again, who have committed crimes which, altogether great, are not irremediable, who in a moment of anger, for example, have done violence to a father or a mother, and have repented for the remainder of their lives, or who have taken the life of another under the like extenuating circumstances, these are plunged into Tartarus, the pains of which they are compelled to undergo for a year. But at the end of the year the wave casts them forth, mere homicides by way of Cositis, parasites and matricides by Pyriphlegethon, and they are borne to the Acherusian lake, and there they lift up their voices, and call upon the victims whom they have slain or wronged, to have pity on them, and to be kind to them, and let them come out into the lake. And, if they prevail, then they come forth and cease from their troubles. But if not, they are carried back again into Tartarus, and from thence into the rivers unceasingly, 
until they obtain mercy from those whom they have wronged, for that is the sentence inflicted upon them by their judges. Those two who have been pre-eminent for holiness of life are released from this earthly prison, and go to their pure home, which is above, and dwell in the purer earth. And of these, such as have duly purified themselves with philosophy, live henceforth altogether without the body, in mansions fairer still which may not be described, and of which the time would fail me to tell. Wherefore, Simeus, seeing all these things, what ought not we to do that we may obtain virtue and wisdom in this life? Fair is the prize, and the hope great. A man of sense ought not to say, nor will I be very confident that the description which I have given of the soul and her mansions is exactly true. But I do say that, inasmuch as the soul is shown to be immortal, he may venture to think, not improperly or unworthily, that something of the kind is true. The venture is a glorious one, and he ought to comfort himself with words like these, which is the reason why I lengthen out the tale. Wherefore, I say, let a man be of good cheer about his soul, who, having cast away the pleasures and ornaments of the body as alien to him, and working harm rather than good, has sought after the pleasures of knowledge, and has arrayed the soul, not in some foreign attire, but in her own proper jewels, temperance and justice, and courage and nobility and truth. In these adorned she is ready to go on her journey to the world below when her hour comes. You, Simeus and Sabes, and all other men, will depart at some time or other. Me, already, as the tragic poet would say, the voice of fate calls. Soon I must drink the poison, and I think that I had better repair to the bath first in order that the women may not have the trouble of washing my body after I am dead. When he had done speaking, Crito said, And have you commands for us, Socrates, anything to say about your children, or, or any other matter in which we can serve you? Oh, nothing particular, Crito. Only, as I have always told you, take care of yourselves. That is a service which you may be ever rendering to me and mine, and to all of us whether you promise to do so or not. But if you have no thought for yourselves, and care not to walk according to the rule which I have prescribed for you, not now, for the first time, however much you may profess or promise at the moment, it will be of no avail. We will do our best, said Crito. And in what way shall we bury you? Um, in any way that you like. But you must get hold of me and take care that I do not run away from you. And he turned to us, and added, with a smile, I cannot make Crito believe that I am the same Socrates who have been talking and conducting the argument. He fancies that I am the other Socrates, whom he will soon see, a dead body, and he asks, how shall he bury me? And though I have spoken many words in the endeavour to show that when I have drunk the poison I shall leave you and go to the joys of the blessed, these words of mine, with which I was comforting you and myself, have had, as I perceive, no effect upon Crito, and therefore I want you to be surety for me to him now, as at the trial he was surety to the judges for me, but let the promise be of another sort for he was surety for me to the judges that I would remain, and you must be surety to him that I shall not remain, but go away and depart, and then he will suffer less at my death, and not be grieved when he sees my body being burned or buried. I would not have him sorrow at my hard lot, or say at the burial, Thus we lay out Socrates, or thus we follow him to the grave or bury him for false words are not only evil in themselves but they infect the soul with evil be of good cheer then my dear crito and say that you are burying my body only 
and do with that whatever is usual and what you think best. When he had spoken these words, he arose and went into a chamber to bathe. Crito followed him and told us to wait. So we remained behind, talking and thinking of the subject of discourse, and also of the greatness of our sorrow. He was like a father of whom we were being bereaved, and we were about to pass the rest of our lives as orphans. When he had taken the bath, his children were brought to him, and the women of his family also came, and he talked to them and gave them a few directions in the presence of Crito. Then he dismissed them and returned to us. Now the hour of sunset was near, for a good deal of time had passed while he was within. When he came out, he sat down with us again after his bath, but not much was said. Soon the jailer, who was the servant of the eleven, entered and stood by him, saying, To you, Socrates, whom I know to be the noblest and gentlest and best of all who ever came to this place, I will not impute the angry feelings of other men, who rage and swear at me, when, in obedience to the authorities, I bid them drink the poison. Indeed, I am sure that you will not be angry with me, for others, as you are aware, and not I, are to blame. And so fare you well, and try to bear lightly what must needs be. You know my errand. Then, bursting into tears, he turned away and went out. Socrates looked at him and said, I return your good wishes, and will do as you bid. Then turning to us, he said, How charming the man is! Since I have been in prison he has always been coming to see me, and at times he would talk to me, and was as good to me as he could be. And now see how generously he sorrows on my account. We must do as he says, Crito, and therefore let the cup be brought if the poison is prepared if not let the attendant prepare some yet said crito the sun is still upon the hilltops and i know that many a one has taken the draught late and after the announcement has been made to him he has eaten and drunk and enjoyed the society of his beloved do not hurry there is time enough socrates said yes crito and they of whom you speak are right in so acting, for they think that they will be gainers by the delay. But I am right in not following their example, for I do not think that I should gain anything by drinking the poison a little later. I should only be ridiculous in my own eyes for sparing and saving a life which is already forfeit. Please then to do as I say, and not to refuse me. Crito made a sign to the servant who was standing by, and he went out, and, having been absent for some time, returned with the jailer carrying the cup of poison. Socrates said, You, my good friend, who are experienced in these matters, shall give me directions how I am to proceed. The man answered, oh, You only have to walk about until your legs are heavy, and then to lie down, and the poison will act. At the same time he handed the cup to Socrates, who, in the easiest and gentlest manner, without the least fear or change of colour or feature, looking at the man with all his eyes, said Socrates, as his manner was, took the cup, and said, What do you say about making a libation out of this cup to any god? May I, or not? The man answered, well, We only prepare Socrates just so much as we deem enough. I understand, he said, but I may and must ask the gods to prosper my journey from this to the other world, even so, and so be it according to my prayer. Then, raising the cup to his lips, quite readily and cheerfully, he drank off the poison, and hitherto most of us had been able to control our sorrow, but now, when we saw him drinking, and saw too that he had finished the draught, we could no longer forbear, and in spite of myself my own tears were flowing fast, so that I covered my face and wept, not for him, but at the thought of my own calamity in having to part from such a friend. 
nor was I the first, for Crito, when he found himself unable to restrain his tears, had got up, and I followed. And at that moment Apollodorus, who had been weeping all the time, broke out in a loud and passionate cry which made cowards of us all. Socrates alone retained his calmness. What is this strange outcry? I sent away the women, mainly in order that they might not behave in this way, for I have been told that a man should die in peace. Be quiet, then, and have patience. When we heard his words we were ashamed, and refrained our tears, and he walked about until, as he said, his legs began to fail, and then he lay on his back according to the directions and the man who gave him the poison now and then looked at his feet and legs, and after a while he pressed his foot hard and asked him if he could feel, and he said, No, and then his leg, and so upwards and upwards, and showed us that he was cold and stiff. And he felt them himself, and said, When the poison reaches the heart, that will be the end. He was beginning to grow cold about the groin when he uncovered his face, for he had covered himself up and said, they were his last words, he said, Crito, I owe a cock to Asclepius. Will you remember to pay the debt? The debt shall be paid, said Crito. Is there anything else? There is no answer to this question but in a minute or two a movement was heard, and the attendants uncovered him. His eyes were set, and Crito closed his eyes and mouth. Such was the end, Echocrates, of our friend, concerning whom I may truly say that of all the men of his time whom I have known, he was the wisest and justest and best. End of Fido Read by Bob Newfound